All right, turn with me to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7 verse 4 is where we're going to continue. That's where we had stopped. We're going to get into just a little bit of the context, just showing how it's lining up, lining it up with what's to come here in the future with Revelation as we're seeing, but also lining it up with the Old Testament, um, mainly focusing just on Moses and just showing how the Word of God, past, present, and future, because it's his eternal Word, nothing changes, it's past, present, future, what's to come, but we're going to tie it in with a little bit of Abraham to come, Esau and Jacob, um, Jeremiah, Joshua, um, we're going to get in, I mean, David, Isaiah, there, there's so, so many, and uh, just line, lining it up and just showing how it's the way, it's what God has proven over time, it's by his love, and it's, it's life, and life in his son, about how showing that not only does nothing ever change besides uh, what he has established by a new covenant, a blue, a new blood covenant by grace and no longer law, how there's no longer any guilt, shame, condemnation for salvation is all who believe and call upon the Son and repentance, repentance in the mind and in the heart, just understanding why, understanding why he came, being truly sorrowful, giving him your sins, truly accepting him in your heart and wanting to turn that's what it is not a work it's just by the heart understanding true faith and that's how god has been that's who he is it's just nature but now by the work of christ and what he has established by his second covenant by his blood we can truly have peace it is finished we can know god directly have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with him I mean, it's finished by his son. But as we can see, and as we're going to see in the Old Testament as well, that nothing changes. I mean, obviously, they still had work to do. There was still condemnation. They couldn't go directly to God. There was only a high, a high priest for the sacrifice of bull, bulls and goats but um, once a year. And even, even, uh, even, at the be even in Exodus 2 at the beginning, there are times of doing it every single day. And... Uh, but it wasn't satisfying. We're seeing, we're seeing the love, the establishment, and, and, and the truth, the life of what's what's to come, the con consequences, uh, and and what we're seeing today. But now, what it's been finished and finished by the Son, and by what He continues to show us, and uh, it's just amazing. So we're just gonna jump right into the scriptures, just for jump right back uh, to where we were, lining it up. Main focus is just lining it up with the end times, what's to come. And also just showing and proving by the scriptures of the New Testament of what's to come, but also the Old Testament, how it's God's eternal word, his actual breathed word, uh, whether it's his words himself by the prophets, the prophets of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter. It's God breathed and it all lines up and it all backs up by standard, by proof, by facts, by evidence. So it's amazing. So we just take it and line it up and show us and ask God because this is what God wants us. Uh, to see, to show us continuously, and that's just what it is. It's just salvation in the Son. The fact that we could never get to Him, never uh, have salvation by our own works, by anything else outside of the Son, how nothing has ever changed, and as long as we deny Him, deny uh, that, uh, the, deny our sins, deny the, our wickedness, and, and why, uh, you know, all of us turning away from God, as long as we continue to go our, way, our own ways, uh, satisfy the flesh try to embrace life ourself and, and and just turning away and embracing sin and 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 denying god and going and serving other false gods other false religions the same thing is going to happen but it's because of the love of the father and what he continues to prove and what he proved uh two thousand years ago on the cross of calvary sending his son to die for our sins and what he continues to do every single day and we can just go down the list but that's just what it is. It's now finished by the Son. It's the love, and that's ultimately what it comes down to from day one is God just showing His love after He didn't have to, not being satisfied by the blood of bulls and goats, but God having a specific time, a specific way, a specific plan, sending His Son. It's now finished, but that's what it comes down to. That's the that's the idea. Nothing changes. Is We're now free. We're now free by the blood of Christ and all who calls upon Him. All who turns to him, gives in to him, believes, 
truly in the heart will be saved and it's amazing so we're just going to jump right back into where we were and we're just going to uh get uh pray real quick and ask the holy spirit to just guide us and just ask uh for for the lord to show us what it is that he wants us to see what he wants us to take to heart um ask for his wisdom for his knowledge knowledge and just to uh thank him for being together and for glorifying to just to glorify him so heavenly father i thank you so much for being with us lord i thank you for this opportunity lord i'm, I'm just a vessel just just a tool for you to use lord and i just pray and ask that you would speak through me holy spirit i pray and ask that you would guide me this is your eternal word this is who you are alive in us the Holy Spirit speaks through us, gives us understanding, helps us to see by the true living word. It connects. It's nothing like it because you are alive. And we come, I just thank you for being able to come together, Lord. I thank you that we can worship you, come together to learn more about you, your ways, what you want us to know, who we are in you, and just grow in you. But be together as a family, grow as a family, and that's just what it's about, Lord. And I just thank you that, that you have allowed this opportunity that you have used me just to, to speak your scriptures. I just pray and ask that you would help me to teach, help me to preach. And, uh, we, you know, I can't do anything without you. And uh, I just I just love you so much. And I thank you that we can come together and just be together. And I just pray and ask that you would guide us, help us to stay focused, help us to take whatever it is out of the scriptures that you want us to see and apply it to the times that we're in because that's who you are. It's the life and you're with us. And I thank you for that, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for who you are, Lord. I glorify you. I love you so much. Thank you. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Right on. So going to Judges chapter 7, verse 4, where we had uh, where we had left off, we see that Gideon had get, gotten a sign. As we see that this isn't just any old and any ordinary day. This is specific, and this is a reference of what's to come at the final battle, the war. With the kings of all the nations, those who go against Christ, specifically the Antichrist and the beast, that's what's been set up, the devil himself that's been given over power, but what he has established in those who in their heart reject the truth, those who want to go after sin, go after their own ways, but hate the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart, but ultimately in the end, as we see day in a day out, day in a day out whether it's their dreams or whether they wake up the life themselves they have the breath tells them that the lord is right there they can try and get away from him all they want it doesn't matter every time they wake up every life that they have every breath every day that they have in this life is proof that the lord is right there and they can't get away from him but nevertheless their heart that they have the, the feelings of shame, the feeling of guilt, of con consequences, which is eventually going to uh, be seared, if you would, that conscience, as we're seeing today, and it's growing wicked and wicked and wicked and wicked, and God is going to give them over to what they want. So regardless of whether they, they don't want to see because they turn away from it, regardless of whether they don't want to believe, yet whether their heart tells them so, whether they see it with their own eyes and hear it with their own ears, it doesn't matter because they are going to have to stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he comes back and he comes back with 10,000 upon 10,000 of his saints. And this is what we're seeing. And we're seeing Gideon as a type of Christ, a war chief, one who's been built up, the one who the Lord God Almighty has his hand on, specifically focused on, on Israel because he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. He is the true and living God. And his word has always been true. It is established. It's finished. He is the living word and he's alive inside of us. And everything that he says and continues to say and continues to prove today not only brings life, brings power, but shows that it is true because there's nothing like him and there's nothing that will ever be like him. And we are continuing to see that every single day. And it's amazing. So as we see and we jump in and where we finished off in, in verse three, the Lord getting ready for war to bring on war because it's all reference to the end time. It's finished once and for all. And I'm not talking about the sins. I'm talking about the final judgment and what's to come. Line up all the kings, all the warriors, everything you have, because the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings himself is coming back to establish, to draw war and to draw vengeance himself. And I cannot wait for that day. And it's not a fact that I cannot wait for that day of like, yes, I just can't wait to see him reign in his glory of every single day waking up knowing him knowing what's to come but just seeing him in his glory seeing it, seeing it come just to pass but being with him because that's his promise 
and that's not what it is it, it's not just a fact of i mean absolutely yeah i can't wait to be on the back of that horse and to be with him but i just cannot wait to see him coming with ten thousand upon ten thousand of the saints with glory because this is the day that they will for surely know see after this and after they've been separated they have no more of christ they have nothing and that's what's so sad that's what they don't understand so understand what they're seeing too besides the glory the beauty of who the the almighty is when he coming in in the in the uh character in the presence of judgment and wrath with the rod of iron they will for surely remember it and they will remember it for for time to come and it's amazing so as we continue to see and as it builds up and it builds up and it builds up as we're put here for a specific reason and specific time. As we're seeing, we are for surely getting closer and closer to that day. So we see in Judges chapter 7 verse 3, it says, Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once at Mount Gilead. And 22,000 and people return and 10,000 remained. And this is all just a reference to what we see in Jude 1 14 and what we see in the book of Revelations chapter 19 is the Lord God Almighty returning with 10,000 upon 10,000 of his saints to make war, to, to rule and to judge, to wash the saints, to wash the children's blood with those who have martyred, those who have killed the saints, have killed the innocent, but to reign and to reign in the house of David, to, to make his kingdom, to establish his kingdom, and, and, and to uh, to to bring justice upon the earth once and for all and to hand over the land to the Jewish people and to come for his people and to focus as we already see that he has those who are in him, he has those. And there are going to be people in those days, obviously, that come to the Lord Jesus Christ, but the focus is on Israel. See, it goes all the way back to Father Abraham. It goes all the way back to the very beginning, to what's been promised. So it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful love story. See, the fact that he is here with us every single day, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. That's a love story because he is love. First John chapter 4, verse 8 says that God is love, and it's everything that he continues to prove. It's who he is. It's what he proved on the cross. It's what he proved when he gave, gave his life. It's what he proved when he made made our lives. It's what he proves every single day and who he is in every single character. It's the fruit of the spirit. It's who he is. And uh, it's, it's just amazing to see that as we see it's, it's, a re, uh, it's uh, like a reunion. It's just like every single believer, those who he predestined, he knitted in the womb, those who have specific life, specific calling in him, which is every single believer, those who now belong into him. That's a single, that's a love story because it's by the author of love. It's by the one who's written it. So by the one who wrote it, but you have to understand too, from eternity, from eternity, from past, present, future, from where he wrote it out, where he planned it, from the beginning to the end, from how it starts with the house of Israel and how it ends with the house of Israel because he is the author of love and it's amazing because it's the true and living word of God and what we continue to say. That's why it's amazing to see uh, children of the Most High who, who sing. Who, who 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 prays and can worship and write poems and write write stories and, and and can do children's books and can make cards because I mean not not saying that you know there are just highlighting that gift alone because we we see that in every character whether it's it's preaching teaching uh working with the children those are all characters and natures of god so just highlighting that one specifically it's like a love story it's amazing it's a it's like a, a mother's trait it's like it's it's an eternal father and one who would who, who who continues to love and continues to show that but but his word is true his ways are true and how he's he's always there he's the, he's the one who goes past everything it goes into the darkness separates it goes into brings his light and establish it but but from the beginning and what i'm trying to say i'm sorry it was a, it's a little confusing i'm kind of going off course there just saying how he, he his word is true it's always true how he will never forget if it and I guess what I'm just trying to say is that the Lord God is, is not done with Israel, never be done with Israel, is never done with Israel. He had Israel in plan his entire, the entire time. That's the, be, that's the beauty of it. It started with it, now it's going to end with it, and that's what we see. So he comes with 10,000 upon 10,000, those who have been brought in, those who have been married, this is the bride of Christ, that, who, that who, who walks with him, goes with him, those who belong to him already. 
those who return with him. So we see in verse 4, it says, But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring down to the water and test them for you there. For it will be that of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, and the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say, This one shall go, shall not go, and the same shall not go. Because it's his word, it's his establishment, it's his way. He chooses who he wants. He specifically designs it out. And as you can see, he, there are times that he specifically just picks them. And there's times where he'll specifically lay down just a task, a test, and see, as we're going to see here. But it's by his way. And it's by his way that no man could ever change it. He specifically sets it up so that he alone will get the glory. So you have to understand that the hearts of men, the hearts of men have pride, and that's any of us. He knows. He knows how we are. Uh, how we tend to act, who we can be, what we can be in certain times. And this is what we're seeing here. So he's making sure because he doesn't want it to build up in their heart and to turn away. He wants to make sure that not only those who are on the outside, what happens, but those also who belong to him, those also who walk with him, who answer to him, know that there's no way possible how they could ever try and prove that there was any way that they could do this away from God. So he says there's too many. The number's too high. You have to make sure it's lower. Why? Because you got to make sure that they know that it was the Lord God Almighty. That's why in the end when he comes and he comes back with 10,000 upon 10,000 upon 10,000, it doesn't matter how many because they're going to be looking at the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But here is we're making sure as God has still established it, it's by his way. As he wants to know what he wants to us to know today and every every nation that or every generation that has come. But every nation that's out there that 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 there's no other way that we could try and disprove that this is the Lord God Almighty. So we brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. The rest of the people got down on their knees to drink with water. And I was just curious of what you guys would do. Would you guys get down on your knees and drink more like a dog? Or would you cup with your hands and do it? I'm more of a cup drinker. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a fountain. It doesn't matter if it's a pool. I'm more of a cup drinker. But the difference is it doesn't matter where it's at. I'm a dog. And not a dog in a sense to where, oh, yeah, you're a dirty dog. It's just a dog of a loyal dog who goes after his master, who, who wants to be fed by his master, who relies off of his master, who his master will, will truly die for for that dog everywhere the master goes the dog's right there uh, loyal and uh loyal to to his master and that's just what it is but it doesn't matter uh it doesn't matter of how how we're doing as we're together it, in, a, in a sense of a dog as the lord you see the separation whether whether jew gentile whether dog whether uh rich whether holy whether uh righteous the lord god is the lord god over all and he welcomes all and obviously we can only be holy by him but it doesn't matter of those who belong to him and those who would call those who are who are going to be saved by him there's just no difference now to him uh by him and by his ways and we look at it we look at it as compared to the lord it's not like oh yeah you're you're nothing but just a filthy dog that's not what it is it's just compared to the lord we're nothing compared to the lord a dog would be nothing without his master he wouldn't be able to eat he wouldn't be able to survive he wouldn't be able to have anything he wouldn't have a home and that's just the sense of it but the lord god welcomes it and it's not a sense it's a it's a term taken way out but as you can see when we see and we go to six and the number of those who lap putting their hands in their mouth were 300 men, but the rest of the people got down by their knees to drink water. So there's no actual context of a type of who's a dog and who isn't because the context is compared to the Lord God Almighty, we're all dogs and because uh, we're all nothing. We're all sinners saved by grace. He is the one who's everything. He is the one who's the most high. He's the one who's holy. It, it's his love, who he is by what he does, nothing by, by who we are, but what we could ever do. It's by him. And it's what separates it. So as he's establishing it, and this is where they get the idea where you've seen that, that uh, movie 300 going against the Persian army where they, the Romans, they just stole it. It's just the idea. Um, where do you think they get it? And I apologize too when I'm going to be jumping back and forth. I just want to go over. There's a lot of detail and I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. So it says, Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men who lapped 
I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let the other people go, every man to his place. So as we see, this is a this is a type of, of what's going to happen when the Lord God Almighty returns with 10,000 upon 10,000 of his saints. And he calls, he calls um, the children of Israel back to him. See, there's going to be very few that stay with him, and that's 300. And as we can see, 300, 300 uh, divided by 12 would be 25. So that you're going to get um, about 25 men from each tribe of the house of Israel to stay there. The rest will go up. They, because that's just what it comes down to, just like doubt, just like with Moses wasn't able to enter into the promised land just like the children of israel there's going to be a very few uh 300 men when the lord returns with ten thousand upon ten thousand of his saints which is 25 from each tribe and the rest will go up because of their doubt because of they're going to want to to uh have that vengeance they're going to want to to be there but they won't be allowed to he's going to only pick a very few the rest of those who get raptured up with him who return with them will be there with him so just going over that real quick um we see let the other people go every man to his place so this is when the lord god returns and he calls up Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles go up, Jews go up, except for those specific. And this is where the final war starts to begin. But as we continue and as we're going to carry it along at the end of Judges 7 and, and towards chapter 8, we're also going to see what happened during that three and a half year mark where the Lord God saves them and hides them in the rocks. A lot of amazing scholars and teachers have shown and, and believe this to be Petra. I personally believe that as well as it's the same path exactly uh, when you line it up from Abraham, from Jacob to Esau. It's the same thing and where the Lord God will hide them. So we're going to kind of see what happens amongst that during that time. But right now as we're seeing as the Lord God is coming back, what happens with the people with, around with the children of Israel. So real quick, go, go with me. I'm going to go back to some scriptures and, and, and tie it in. Uh, Isaiah 33, we're going to go to verse 19. So Isaiah chapter 33, we're going to go to verse 19. I'm going to start verse 17. It says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. This is kind of like Daniel, what Daniel saw as well. They will see the land that is a very far off. Your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? You will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception of stammering tongue that you cannot understand. Look up, Zion, the city of our appointed feast. So we see the highlight, the focus is on Zion and Jerusalem. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down because he is the true tabernacle. He is the tabernacle of the living God. He is, he is the way, the, the, the path, it was the veil. It's through him, the direct presence of the living God that we can get to him. It's only by him. No longer by law, no longer man-made, nothing that we could ever do. He is the true living tabernacle that's now alive inside of us. It says, not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cord be broken. But there will be a majestic Lord will, will be for us, a place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley with oars will sail. No majestic ships shall pass by. For the Lord is our judge. For the Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. So you see the context is Israel. And on the children of Israel. Because during this time when the Lord God returns. With those who have been raptured. The focus is on Israel. Your tackle is loose. They, they could not strengthen their mass. They could not spread sail. Then they pray, a great plunder is divided. The lame take the prey, and the inhabitants will not say, I'm sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. And this is his people. So real quick, let's go to Exodus chapter 24, verses 14. Exodus chapter 24, verses 14.
I'm going to start in verse 13. It says, So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. It's a, a pre tribulation rapture. Indeed, Aaron and her are with you. If by any means was difficult, let him go. Then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on the Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, type of seven-year tribulation, he called out to Moses out of the midst of clouds, type of Christ. So a type of bride being brought up to Christ, now coming back as Christ after seven years. Focus on Israel. Now you see those who have, he has had weight right there are going to be established with him. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel because it's the, it's the type of judgment and judgment of what's to come. Behold, behold who he is, not even just a smidge, not even a percent of who he fully is, but too much to where they can bear to where they tremble. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, you will tremble upon that and in the presence of a living God when it's his, when it comes as, as judgment, just like what we see in Matthew, uh, forgive me, I believe it's chapter five when he goes up on Mount Tabor, uh, and, and it's a type of what's to come as, a, as Moses and Elijah and with, his, with Peter there, James and John, and Christ being a type of the tabernacle uh, with the, the cloud of God over him and with the voice of God, the type of, of, of judgment even you know, made the disciples tremble and shake, except for those who were with him, those who were in his glory, Moses and Elijah, those who returned with him. A type of the seven year tribulation and what's to come for judgment. It says, So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So, what we see is it says, Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and cloud covered it six days, and on the seventh day he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the side of the glory was like a consuming fire. So, on top of the mountain, in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up in the mountain. So you, you see that it was Moses was taken up. Then after seven days, it goes out in the midst. And then a type to be referred to goes uh, back, referring it to the children of Israel. And a type of the seven-year tribulation and what's to come. And the 40 days, 40 nights, testing, going, going to testing, to trial. I mean, the children of Israel... Uh, after they were brought out and they had to wander for, for 40 years and then Christ being taken in the desert, in the wilderness uh, for testing, for trial. And that's, that's what it's highlighting here and that's what it's, that's what it's about. Um, so real quick, let's go to, because after that, we see that, that, that this instructions, we're also going to come back and, and line up Exodus, but real quick, um, you don't have to go there. I'm going to go to Revelation 19, uh, 9 real quick, just to read it to you guys. See, lining it up with the end times. Because it says, then he said to me, right blessed are those who called to the marriage supper of the lamb. So this isn't the wedding feast. This is the marriage supper. This is the when God returns with the children of Israel. Mm. Sorry, when God returns with his saints for the children of Israel, focused on Israel. All right, so going back to Judges. Judges chapter 7, verse 7. All right, so I apologize. Verse 8, it says, So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and they sent away the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and restrained those 300 men. Now in the camp, Midian was below him in the valley. And this is going to be Valley of Megiddo. Uh, Battle of Armageddon. So it says, It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hands. Kind of just like what he told Joshua, uh, what we're actually going to get into before he handed over Jericho. He says, I've already handed, take off your shoes where you stand holy. I've already handed it to you. 
and uh, because who can go up against the true and living God? Nothing can. It's already been it's already been finished, just like it's been finished on the cross already. Who He is and, and raising from the dead. Death, where is your sting? The war and the battle, no matter what it is, when it goes up against the true and living God, it's already over before it started. It says, um, excuse me, it happened on that same night, the Lord said, Arise, go down to the camp, I've delivered it in your hands, but if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hands shall be strengthened, and go down against the camp. Now obviously the Lord, we see that the Lord just sent away uh, th these specific people that he had tested, referring to the children of Israel, of what's he... Uh, of when he's to come but as we see right here i believe the lord god is doing this specifically for pura in this camp so that their eyes also will will not be able to deny it so that they will see it themselves but also have they will see that the lord god almighty the lord god of israel is with them because it's who's true to him it's who stays true it, it's it's him going for that one lost sheep and him, him uh, establishing that connection, that bond, that com covenant with his son, that blood covenant with who, he, with who he has. So I believe personally the Lord obviously didn't need them. We know that for sure. But it's just using this not only to build up uh, those who are with Gideon, with the faith, but uh, those who are of this camp. And you shall hear what they say afterwards. Your hand shall be strengthened. Okay. It says, Then he went down to Pira and his servant, the outposts of the armed men who were camped. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as num numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand of the seashore multitude. And this is exactly what we're going to see in the end times, what's the kings of the east, those who have risen up, the kings of the world, those who have gone against Christ, the Mashiach, those who belong to him, and those who think that they can stand to him instead of... Uh, tanks and, and choppers and military vehicles we see it as locusts but it's interesting because just like what we see in revelation i apologize but i believe it's revelation 9 when we see locusts let's i'm gonna go to revelation 9 real quick kind of like kingdoms of this world what do we see we see armies military vehicles tanks locust type of, of uh, like a chopper if you would Okay, Revelation 9, 3, it says, Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and, the, and to them was given power as scorpions of the earth had power. So even though this isn't the final battle, I believe that this is the same type of locust that will be there as a reference to uh, the kings of the earth lining up, trying to go to war against Christ when they try to fill up the air, when they try to fill up everywhere they can. And as you see in a, in a reference of how John is trying to interpret it, how he's trying to put it together in a sense, in a way to how you would try to put it together uh, a chopper in a time where they obviously didn't have choppers. Now, I believe, I believe as in the days of Noah, when God flooded the world, that there was technology beyond where we're at, if not where we're at. But we're, when John is writing it, John had trying to put it together. You, you kind of try and put it in that sense, but putting in a spiritual factor of things that can't see, but in a physical form of, in, in of military, of armors, and how that would be today. So just a reference and a type. I'm going to go back to Judges, too, and just kind of fill in some uh, things and just uh, going over some detail and just lining up some scriptures. Because this is going to be just like Moab. From the east, the Assyrian Empire, those who worship the devil, those who have been, uh, you know, those who uh, answered, and those that's what's been given over to the beast. And uh, it's going to be the world, the world, you know, Turkey, Russia, China. Now, granted, I'm tying it in and lining it up with the UK. I think everybody sees that coming. And, and just tying it in with the end times and the ten points, the ten kingdoms and kingdoms that are to come from spiritual and physical uh, and, and what's been given to the beast, but also understanding in a fact, and I don't know 
what exactly which kingdoms will, but I do believe that there are going to be kingdoms, as we see in the scriptures, uh, that are going to consume other kingdoms and kingdoms that will give to other kingdoms. And I believe the UK is, is a huge one, a major one, that will uh, take a part of the majority of countries, be a huge kingdom itself, and be given to the beast. Now, how lining it up, what countries, what kingdoms consumes what, I, you know, I don't know, honestly. But uh, however it is that the Lord has that and, and, is, and they end up doing that, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be those kingdoms that, and then the kingdoms of the world that are given over to the beast because it's you're either with the Lord or you're against him. It's a house divided can't stand. You either serve and worship the true and living God or you stand against him. And that ultimately that's what it's going to come down to. It's going to be uh, men and women uniting in sin and under antichrist under beast hatred perversion and those who stand with the true and living god purity love righteous grace right standing with the lord those who have been saved so with the armies type type of because it's just going to get pushed back and pushed back and it's going to be established but but as we can see and we're going to line it up to a mount moriah um when we go actually real quick to just tying it in real quick i'm going to go to revelation 16 12. i'm going to uh you can go there if you want i'm just going to read it it says then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east saw might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So lining it up to here what we see in Judges, those who of the east and those who stand against the Lord are, are those who have been brought over and those who, the, those who belong to the beast give their kingdom over to the beast. And then they turn their focus and try against go against the Lord God Almighty and it's as we can see time and time and time and time again, it doesn't matter how you try and stand against the Lord God Almighty through your own selfish ways, through rebellion, through sin, through your own might. It doesn't matter. It will never, ever be good. It will never, ever go man's way, your own way. But we will always have to uh, understand that it's the Lord's way. It's the Lord's law. It's his love. It's, it's how, who he is, what he established. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. So it doesn't matter what we try and do. We're going to learn the hard way. And I believe personally that's every single day, every single day that we deny him, that we go against him. I don't know how anybody could even live, uh, you know, just not being in a relationship with the Lord God Almighty and thinking about their life, thinking about who he is. But they will have to face it regardless. They face it every single day and they will face it with their knee, with their tongue when they confess because... They will for surely look upon him, understand, and they will call out to him. But it will be too late then, I'm afraid. That's why it's so important why we can't why we can't wait. So you see it as it's kind of getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Because that's what it is. It's going to be uh, the Lord God. Just like he establishes, just comes and plows on through. So, real quick too, because as we see with that, the type of uh, 12 from each tribe going into 300, be 25, 25 from each tribe. Um, so it's a type, also a type of David, a foreshadow on what's to come with the 12 tribes of Israel, just like what we can reference to Christ coming, establishing the kingdom. Um, but real quick too, I just want to go over because, okay, so what we see here too, just kind of going back, I went from just verse eight to 13, just to kind of get an idea. So I'm going to go back and we're going to go back and read these trumpets real quick and just kind of get a sense because then we're going to start tying it in also with Joshua. Um, so judges, I'm going to go to judges chapter seven, verse nine.
sorry, verse eight says that they had trumpets in their hands. So kind of getting that idea. Um, real quick, let's go to, uh, just to get, as we see, before I get a little bit too far off on that, turn with me real quick. Before we go to Joshua 2, turn with me to Numbers chapter 13, verse 2. Numbers chapter 13, verse 2. Okay, because we're going to see a type of spy. Okay, so verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader amongst them. So we see also a spy of what we're going to see uh, just like in Joshua. So just tying this in with trumpets of what we're going to get into eventually with Joshua let's get an idea of just some spies and spies to come um, so yeah real quick okay turn with me to Joshua chapter 2 Joshua chapter 2 now keep an idea of what we read in verse uh, verse 9 chapter 7 verse 9 with trumpets we're gonna line that up with Joshua but just getting an idea of some spies Joshua chapter 2. Okay, now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Achaia, grove of spies, secretly saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went out and came to the house of the harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told that the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come down here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So just getting an idea. Turn with me real quick because we're right here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 42. Just getting an idea of, of Joseph and Benjamin. Just kind of how it lines up. I'm not going to go over the entire, obviously the entire chapters. I'm just going to go to a couple of verses. This is in verse 8. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered that the dream, remember that dream, because also with Gideon, we're going to tie it in a dream with Daniel, but a dream, right? Uh, remember that dreams in which dreamed about and said to them, you are spies. You have come to the nakedness of the land. So as we see that type and the type of spy, but also we see in verse 3, it says, Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, least some uh, calamity befall him. So going to uh, verse uh, chapter 43 now, it says, now the famine was in the, the land. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain that they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back and buy us little food. So Joseph, uh, Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face and left your brothers with you. If you send your brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, What did the deal so wrong with, wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether he, you still had another brother? But they said, The man asked for pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And those words he told them according to these words. So, as we're going to see here too, just kind of getting the idea. I'm going to jump real quick to verse 14. It says, So the men took that present and Benjamin and took double money into their hand and they arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Egypt, uh, before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin was with them, he said to them, steward of this house, take these men home and slaughter an animal and make ready for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered and the man brought the man into Joseph's house. So, okay, one more, one more real quick. Jump with me to 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 4. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 4. I'm going to start on verse 3. It says, And Saul encamped at the hill 
of Hekilah, which is opposite of Jeshimon, and by the road, but David stayed in the wilderness, David, a type of Israel. And he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, and therefore David sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. But it's also referring to Israel, obviously David being a type of Christ. But when we're lining it up here, Christ doesn't need to send spies because it's, it's the beginning, it's the final. We're just lining it up with who God has raised up, his word, his ways, and, and just how it, it continues to show itself over and over and over and over again. And what these kings and these, and these elite and those who stand against the Lord God Almighty, how it will continue to be time and time and time again. That they will have to face the wrath and the judgment because they refuse the blood of the Son and the, and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for us and by what God has continuously done time and time again, whether it be from the first covenant to now the new one in the Son. So we get an idea for trumpets real quick. Let's go to Judges. I'm just going to be finishing up here. Go back to... Go back with me to Judges chapter 7. I'm just going to go to verse 12. So we see the lying as locusts. And we're going to see a dream here. An idea, get an idea of dream. Kind of like Daniel. It says, and when, when Gideon had come up, there was a man telling a dream. And his companion said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of the Midian. And it came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned that tent and collapsed. And my friends, brethren and sister, we know who that bread is. Because this is the same type of vision, type of dream that Daniel got. When he says, I see the son of man. This is the manna. The one, the true and living God. The bread. The, the bread of life. The one who's inside of us. The one who feeds us. The one who, who gives us life. Who's always there. Who satisfies us. This is what Gideon is seeing. Just like Daniel, he, he, it's what, he is, what he's seeing. Is he's understanding the establishment of judgment and what's to come and those who have turned against him. He, sees, he says to a dream, to my surprise, a loaf of barley bread could be a piece of show bread, just like with David. It says it came to a tent and struck it could be that false tabernacle and, and what's going to be built in the end, but it's all just lining it up to the Midianites, Canaanites, those who have given the kingdoms over to the beast, the bread, the manna, the, the true and living God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings that comes back, the rider on the white horse who rules with the rod of iron. The one whom the nations all have to bow to, the winds, the seas, the storms, they all answer to him. He's the one who has life and life by his breath. Everything that, that he has and he, he, is, he, he wills is what we see and what we have today because it's what's been given to him. And understand as our brain, our brain in this and, our, and what we can only comprehend is below 3%. So try to understand that and try to understand life and life in general. Not only can you do it, do it outside of Christ because Christ is the life. But my friends, brothers and sisters, outside of, of Christ, there's, there's nothing, there's no meaning, there's no purpose. Through him, it's not only new constantly every day, and not new as a, as like a new uh, a new covenant, new relationship. It's just new, his ways. Learning more about him constantly every day. That's what it's about. You can try and go after the things of this world. You will eventually gain all the knowledge of this world. Nothing will satisfy you here. Try and go after him, and try and wrap your mind around him. Not only is it blasphemy to kind of think about that. So I'm sorry that I repent. I'm, I apologize. Sorry, Lord. Um, but just try and under, try and wrap your mind around who he, who he is. And, and try and wrap your mind around getting to know him every single day. Because it's going to take you all of eternity to get to know him. Because you can't. You can't because he is the eternal being. And that's what it's about. He is the treasure. He is the life. He is the truth. He's everything. He's what it all comes down to. He's the meaning. You get rid of everything. None of this stuff could ever satisfy you. Not only can you not take any of it with you, but what's more, 
what treasure, what treasure that's just going to buy you more poison, treasure that's just going to buy you more clothes, that's just going to rot and wither away. You have to just keep giving and giving and giving. What, what is true treasure? What is true treasure? I'll tre tell you what true treasure is. It's the living God. It's the Lord God Almighty. He is the treasure. He's the one who doesn't rust, corrodes. He's the one who gave it all, gave his life, created everything. He's the one who establishes, give us that new peace, that bread, that, that satisfying, that, that, uh, peace and, and calmness in the midst of the storm. The one who already fought the war and fights the battles. The one who goes in front of us. The one who is the light who says, I'll walk in the darkness. You walk in the darkness, but you have the light. He's the one that's with you. The one that gives you all the armor and is there with us. Who has, we have the comforter because of him. The one who covers us with his blood. The one that continues to show it every single day. His mercy, his grace. The one who's changing lives left and right. We can literally go all day on who the true and living treasure is. And it's the Lord God Almighty himself. And it's, I just wish people would come to that. I pray people will continue to come to that. I have faith. I know it. That's why we're still here. As God is adding to his, uh, to the family, to his family. And as what we see, what, what men has planned, some people just need to learn the hard way. That's what it's going to come down to. And that's what I tell myself, Lord, please save my family. And if that means the seven year tribulation, so be it. I don't care. As, you know better. You know what they need. Please just don't let them go. Please let them, whatever it takes to realize that. So what's got to happen? You got to take it all away. Piece by piece by piece. Take away the gold, take away the cash, take away the TV, take away the electricity, take away the foundation, take away it all piece by piece until you realize who the true treasure is, until you realize who the true foundation is, until you truly realize who the true and living God is, the one who's always been there for you, the one who will never leave you, never forsake you, the one who takes all your anxieties, all your pain, everything, your cares, cast it upon him, the one who conquered death in the grave, conquered the sin for us so that we can be free subconsciously not actually by free by this flesh that we carry around but whoever the sun sets free we're truly free indeed there's no more guilt there's no more shame there's no more condemnation that's what it is there's no more law those who are in the sun are truly free and then that's what it is there's no more of that consciousness of of shame of guilt because the true and living god the true treasure who is the son, he is the kingdom, the kingdom come, because he is the life, everything comes by him, and, and for him, is held up through him, he's the life, he's the treasure, and this is what Gideon is seeing, and this is what we're seeing too, as a type of, of Daniel, and what's to come, just like Daniel sees his eyes as a flame of fire, hair like wool, that brighter than the sun, it rolled into a tent and struck it and it fell and overturned and that tent collapsed. So not only was it completely flipped upside down, just like when Christ goes into the temple, <coughs> excuse me, takes their establishment, everything they have, everything they've set up and completely flips it up upside down. But just like what we're seeing here and what he's going to establish in the house of David, um, so honestly, yeah, just a type of that, but it's a dream too, a dream that Gideon's getting. And we're also going to re uh, reference in a type to Daniel and type of the beast. Um, but real quick, I'm going to go ahead and just stop right there. But real quick, before I stop. Before I stop real quick, let's go. I just want to see. Because it says in verse 12 that the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous of locusts and their camels were without number as the sand of the seashore, right? Telling a dream and its interpretation, he returned to, it, to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he had divided the 300 companies and put the trump into every man's hand the empty pitchers and the torches inside the pitchers. Okay, real quick. 
I apologize, guys. Sorry. I wanted you guys to see this real quick. Because what we see here... People of the East were lying in the valley, right? So it's like they're raised like locusts. So bear with me here real quick. Check this out. See if you can kind of get this idea. Okay. Uh, you don't have to turn here, but this is kind of where I'm going to end it. But just getting an idea. I'm going to go to Exodus 8.20 real quick. And the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the, out to the water. Understand that too. So it's kind of like rising out of the water. What? Who does? Pharaoh, a type, a type of Babylon, a type of that, uh, the beast, if you would. Obviously, Pharaoh would be more of a type of an antichrist, but just dying in here. Then they said, thus says the Lord. Let my people go and they may serve me or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and on your servants and the people into your houses and the houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of flies and also the ground in which they stand. So you can kind of understand and kind of see too as what, what just like at the beginning and what Lord, the Lord sends. What men tries to do, tries to set up and goes against the Lord, just like they go to the rocks and the caves and they say, fall on us. Okay, maybe they will. Maybe they'll fall right on you, as the Lord says. What they put their trust and their hope in is it'll just get flipped around on them. Okay, you want some locusts? You want some firepower? What if you just turn on your, what if the Lord just turns all the mechanical? You know, it's just by his word. He can do whatever he wants. He doesn't even need to. But what if all those locusts and those choppers and military tanks just kind of turned on them on themselves? Um, okay, and real, real fast, I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having the seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head... A blasphemous name and also guys of what I'm what I'm gonna do in a couple days lining it up with the stones lining it up with the chakras basically what I'm tying it into and what I'm focusing on right now mainly with Daniel is a type of tabernacle because you you understand too it's it's beast false prophet and a type of Antichrist but you understand the children of Israel not only are they waiting for their temple when the, the Antichrist comes, he's going to give them a type of tabernacle. And referring to that breastplate and what he is going to try and establish, what he's going to wear, you, you line it up not only with astrology, um, with psychedelic New Age, you line it up with uh, the mandibles of Hinduism, of Buddhism, of Satanism, and the 12 points, the 12 stars... But what's, what's interesting and what I'm referring and what I'm going to do in this video next is lining up with the 12 stones, that which is the tribe of Naphtali, Manasseh, Dan, that's what's missing as you see through Genesis, Exodus, Dan, 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 and then it's Manasseh at Revelation. Um, tying it in with the chakras, the seven chakras of the Kundalini are the same chakras with the... Um, of what they teach in the Jewish uh, mysticism, esoteric cabal. And it's all just, you know, root, uh, you know, like throat, heart. But what's interesting is the top, you have the seven points. You have the seven kingdoms. You have six that are. And then the seventh and eighth, the seventh, the five that have fallen, the sixth that is, and the seventh that's to come, and then the eighth one that's just like it. Well, the only all we have all of them, if you would, except what's to come, the third eye and the crown. That's uh, seven, uh, six and seven. So you have this awakening, you have this enlightenment. But when the beast comes with that uh, kingdom, with that third eye, not only with the mark, with the enlightenment, with that deception, tying it in with religion, with the false prophet, 
um, you have that chakra, that kundalini, that new age mysticism, but the colors line up with the stones, the stages line up with the points. So what the, it's, 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 it's hard in a sense because it's so much information and it's so much information of just tying it down, breaking it down into specific details of where it's coming from, what it's going to be, but how the Lord is uh, showing me and lining it up with the uh, specifically with uh, religion, with the false prophet, the tabernacle, and then also the beast, the mark, uh, the antichrist. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, what I was uh, kind of going over to and kind of going to show you guys is that's what it is. It's the what's to come, and then what's the seventh one, and then the seventh, and then the eighth that comes is just the same. That isn't here yet. The crown. The crown. Ten crowns. That's the crown chakra. That's the, you've you've reached enlightenment. You've, that's it. And that's why the mark is just the mark. But what I, what I personally am, am, am starting to believe too and, and starting to realize that what the Lord is showing me, when it says, because there's not going to be different marks. The mark's just a mark, but it's going to work for different ways. So when it says for those who have the, worship his his name, uh, take his number, you know, or those who have the mark worship the name, you have the number. It's all tied in together. But what I'm what I'm starting to realize, just like with the coexist and bringing it all to all together under one under the Pope, with the kingdoms, you have those who will worship and be sealed through religion. Just like what we see with the bindi, with Hinduism, with that dot, the third eye. So you'll have people that have the mark that are good because they worship the beast. And then you'll have people in America who have that same or like type of the world because America won't. Sorry, America won't be America during that point. But, but you'll have same people that are hooked to that same mark that use it for buying or selling. You know, one like, uh, you know, Dylan or Granny Jean down the road here who isn't into all that religion see those who are belong to the religion they're good because they have the mark they they've sub fully subdue fully subject to the beast but then you have you know granny jane down the road who just wants to go to the store get her medicine and, and whatnot so she has the mark so whether it's that so you you kind of see and kind of get an idea so i'm just lining it up and doing that i'm going to do that in a couple days doing it in sections and then I'm going to focus more because it's all breaking it down of where it comes from, how it comes from the nature of the enemy and how it all lines up to ancient Egypt, how it's always been the same. Um, so that's what the Lord has me doing. Sorry to kind of go off there, just keeping you guys posted. I'm going to do that in a couple of days and I'm going to stop right here in Judges. And I think here in just a little bit after I grab something to eat, I'm going to jump right into Matthew. So we'll go ahead and stop on verse uh, 14. So when we come back in just a couple days, we'll just continue where we left off. Judges chapter 7 verses 14 and just carry it on. And when we continue, we keep going. I'll show you kind of what the Lord, what we're seeing here too. We're definitely going to be getting into Joshua and uh, Jericho, but the, the the city of AI, artificial intelligence, a type of the beast. Um, we're going to go to uh, you know Jeremiah, Jeremiah and the destruction of Jerusalem, just to kind of get an idea. Obviously, Daniel's dream, bread of the tabernacle, kind of type of David, just like what we talked about. Yeah, so when we eventually get into it too, I, I know that we're going to get into it's a type of wedding, which is amazing. And I just was curious on when we're kind of coming up to that.
Okay. So about getting into about verse 19. Yeah. So getting into verse 19, check this out. So in Judges chapter 7, verse 19, it says, Gideon and 300 men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And as they broke the pitchers that were in the hand, so like glass, right? Um, this is a type of a Jewish wedding. And it's at the type of what? A beginning of a ceremony of the bride, you know, going down the aisle after the glass is broken. So it's a type of the, uh, to the end. Um, and then what's, yeah, what's broken in a, Jewish, a, a glass cup? So, and then you have the horn too, the shofar. It's all just coming down to Yom Kippur and just a type of the wedding supper and uh, all based off of the groom. They blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They lo lay hold um, of the torches in their hands, a type of candles. Just like a Jewish wedding, the torch, the candles, as it all lines up. Awesome. Man, I love the Word of God so much. Let's thank Him and thank Him for um, His Word, for who He is, that we can come together, um, for His understanding, that the Holy Spirit will take the message and that, that we can just glorify Him. So, Lord Jesus, I thank You so much, Lord. Thank You that we are able to come together and have Your Word, Lord. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like just being able to come together, be with You, to learn about You, be together as family, to grow in the Scriptures, to have the Scriptures, Your perfect, preserved Word. Everything you are, everything who, who you continue to show us, Lord, day in and day out. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that you've allowed us to see, allowed us to understand your scriptures, your word, what's to come. For you are the life, the way, and the truth alive in us. And you continue to uh, assure us, continue to show us and see day in and day out your peace, your truth, what's to come, your love. And uh, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you so much for uh, your family, Lord. Uh, thank you for the church. Thank you for those who, you know, are just out in the world. Those who have, you have preaching, those who have helping with kids, those who are in worship, those who are just attending, those who are at, at work preaching the word, those who are helping, those who are behind the, behind the scenes, you just don't get seen. Your spirit alive in the word, Lord, I, in the world, I thank you. I thank you for your word and Holy Spirit, I just pray and ask that you would help us to just take this word and, and, and resonate it on our heart. And, and just take it with us and i just thank you that we were able to come together and learn uh and just grow in you lord and glorify you lord there's nothing better there's nothing better than just getting with you and just glorifying you lord and, and just growing with you lord i love you so much thank you for the church lord for the body of christ thank you for who you are thank you for being with us and continuously showing and uh it's just your comfort it's your peace it's who you are and i thank you lord jesus i love you so much in your holy name amen right on guys so i'm just going to take a little break and then i think i'm going to get into matthew for a little bit so i'll see you in just a uh just a little bit okay god bless you